Hey everyone, I'm Brugley, the Backrooms YouTuber, and in this video I'm going to be explaining six of the safest, hospitable, and most calming levels in the backrooms. These levels have no dangers, no entities, and none of that stuff. Nothing wants to eat you. That's all I care about. I know lots of you enjoy these compilation style videos, so if you do find yourself enjoying, I would appreciate you leaving a like. Thank you so much for watching, and let's get into the video, shall we? The level starts with a quote that reads as follows. Been walking around this countryside level some more. Gets me thinking, seeing all these abandoned things. Do you ever wonder how entities see us? Like, the entities we don't talk to? I wonder if they wonder where we came from. End quote. Nice. So yeah, level 184 is classified as a class 1 difficulty and is safe, devoid of entities, but it isn't fully secured because we don't know where the borders are. It's close enough to being safe. Okay. The level also goes by the name the Field of Forgotten Forts, and it's a very liminal and picturesque expanse of countryside with a ton of abandoned structures. The level is calm and pleasant, and it's very scenic and relaxing, and there's also a lot of natural resources and fertile ground for growing plants as well. The level is considered to be eerily peaceful, though, by most wanderers who have been here, and it gives this feeling of nostalgia but uneasiness at the same time, sort of like level 94 does. The fields of this level grow flowers and plants, just like the ones from the front rooms, and they grow and reproduce and decay, just like the real life ones as well, which makes this place seem even more real than other levels. To make it easy to understand the layout of the level, it's been split up into three distinct parts the grain fields, the canola fields, and then the unkempt plains. The grain fields are huge expanses of wheat and barley and even rice plants in some regards. You can harvest and eat anything that grows here, and it's completely safe to do so. This is the area where you're most likely to run into a bunch of tiny abandoned sheds or little barns, and even a few houses that are old and decaying and abandoned. Most of these old sheds and houses give off really eerie and strange familiar feelings of a past life. Almost like you can feel the beings and things that used to live here, but you can't see them. The canola fields look very similar to the wheat ones, except this area is full of vibrant and bright canola plants. Inside of this area, there are bigger abandoned farms and old decaying farmhouses and barns as well. These old farmhouses are usually barren of anything on the inside, but some have old remnants of furniture and paintings and kitchen utensils and kitchen tables and beds and that sort of thing. Again, you kind of get the feeling of these old energies and this forgotten life when you explore these houses. You feel like you're being watched by the residents of the houses, but you can't see anybody because there's no one there. Past these canola fields, there are the unkempt plains, which are these big, uncultivated, unused plots of land land with no crops or buildings. These places have tall grasses and soft rolling hills, and the only structures you might find here are old fences and stone walls and maybe an old rusty car or two that have been left to decay. And these places are very empty and desolate and lonely, and you could theoretically live here if you want, but it's kind of far out and there's not really anything else to speak of. Since this level is pretty safe and natural, of course there's been a few bases that have been set up here, and there are two main ones that Meg has made, and they are here to harvest the grain and the canola plants. Like I said, both of them are run by Meg, but theoretically, you could live in a rural abandoned house yourself, if you wanted to, or you could just wander around the fields and relax in them for as long as you need to. Cutting through this level, there are random dirt paths and random little brooks and streams that roll through the fields, and these areas help you with exploring the level and finding new places. As I said, no one has found the border of the level yet, so it's thought that it could be infinite, so just explore at your own risk. The ambience of the level is a calm sound of wind blowing through grass and the faint sound of bugs chirping and a light breeze blowing at all times. The sounds give off senses of calmness and peacefulness that isn't often felt through the back rooms. But at the same time, it makes you wonder, what happened to the people that used to be here? Why did they leave and abandon their houses and homes Steads, and what made them leave? Let me know what you think in the comments below. I'm pretty interested to hear what you got to say.
To enter the level, you can walk deep into another level that resembles it. So another level that has fields like level 10 or level 811. And if you wander off deep into those levels, you might find that it'll start to transition into this level. And to exit, you can find a rough dirt road and walk down it until you find a sign that directs you to level 11. Follow that sign and you'll be sent back to level 11. Or sometimes you can even noclip into one of the many structures that is abandoned here. But overall, this peaceful, abandoned expanse of fields and hills sounds like a paradise, if you make it here alive, that is. But I love the vibe that you get from this level. You kind of get that uneasy uncanniness, like something used to live here, and there used to be a, like a civilization here, but it's post-apocalyptic and abandoned. But even though there's nobody here, the stuff still grows, and you can still live here for yourself. So the weather on this level is mostly pretty mild. There could be some rolling clouds and maybe a few spring showers that pop up out of nowhere. But overall, the entire place is devoid of much harmful weather. Like I said earlier, though, there is a pretty decent breeze that blows most times. And this breeze adds to the ambience of loneliness in the fields. But from people who have been to this level, they describe it as very liminal and empty and almost sad in a way. And some people even say that they feel like they have been there before and it's like they're coming back after their home was destroyed or something. But overall, the back room just does that to some people and they get those weird feelings from it. So Backrooms Level 422 is classified as a Class 2 difficulty, and it's moderately safe, and it's pretty secure, with a low entity count. Most of the watery levels in the backrooms that I cover on the channel are dangerous, or they have monsters that are trying to attack you, or something like that, so this one is a very nice breath of fresh air. Even though there are still some dangers, it's still not as bad as, like, the Thalassophobia levels. So this level is an infinite ocean that's made up of a bunch of different kinds of water, depths of water, and then different weathers all around. The water itself also has different saltiness levels depending on where you go, which could be pretty useful for drinking. So far, only some of the level has been mapped out, but as I said, it's probably infinite and there's no way you can map an infinite ocean, but I'll be going over the mapped out part right now. Just know that when you're traveling around this ocean, do not go to any of these empty islands and I'll tell you why later, but just don't go to them. So the day-night cycle of the level is 18 hours. That's 10 hours of daylight and 8 hours of nighttime, and both the sun and the moon can be seen here, which is pretty strange because this isn't real life, it's the back rooms, so why could our own planets be seen? The overall weather in this level is pretty inconsistent as well. It can go from a light rain shower to thunderstorms to sunshine in just random quick intervals. By far, the most common type of weather is just bright sunshine and calm water. Now, the next most common besides that are rain showers. But the mapped out part so far has been split up into four main sections. They are the shallow waters, the middle waters, the deep waters, and the rough waters. So the shallow waters are pretty common. They make up over 25% of the discovered part of the level. The actual water here stays pretty warm in the mid-70s, or 21 degrees Celsius, and this is where it's all primarily fresh water. Even though it's an ocean, most of the water in these shallow regions are fresh, and you can drink it. The water here isn't deep, and you can look straight down and see the bottom of it. The deepest part is around 13 feet, or 4 meters, and the bottom of the sea itself is a soft sand that's dotted with seaweed and other ocean plants, and overall, this is just a very shallow, chill part. The next zone is the middle waters, and these make up around 30% of all the explored parts of the level. Here, the water is slightly cooler, but still a warm 15 degrees Celsius, or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. The waters are around 30 to 70 feet deep here, and they tend to be a little bit darker gray and have darker blue hues than the crystal clear shallow waters. These waters actually have a higher salt count than the other ones, and it's not recommended to drink much of it, but you still can drink a little bit. Now, the weather inside of these middle waters fluctuates more than any other section and it can go from storming to calm at pretty much any time so be ready for that the deep waters are next which are obviously deeper than the middle waters this section makes up the biggest area of the explored parts and the water itself is unsafe to drink because it's just full of salt water the depths in this region can range from 100 feet to almost 500 feet so it can be pretty scary to get into it's also a lot colder in the deeper spots and the weather is mostly 
actually stormy here. But where the weather gets the most intense is in the last area, which is called the rough waters. It's the least common area and it makes up the smallest amount of the explored level, but it's also the most dangerous and you do not want to wander into these rough waters. These regions tend to be actually pretty shallow and they're about the same depth as the middle waters are, around 30 to 70 feet, and the water itself is a cold and brisk 40 degrees Fahrenheit or 8 degrees Celsius. The sea floor underneath these waters is made up of jagged, sharp rocks that could hurt if you touch them, and seashells and that kind of thing, and the area is plagued by heavy storms that almost constantly rip up and tear everything away. The wind is crazy here, the water is splashing, there's lightning strikes, and everything like that. It's just an overall really dangerous place. And you should never go to these parts without a boat, if you even have a boat, but even then, just try to avoid this area. Now, as far as entities go, there's actually one pretty dangerous one here, and it offers mainly the biggest danger in the entire level, and it's these islands themselves. They're the entity. They're called Island Stalkers, and from far away, it looks just like a lush green island. They might have trees or bushes on them, but all that is just what you can see above the surface. They actually have four massive limbs that are over 200 feet long, and they're made up of moss and rocks and dirt, and the majority of these creatures bodies are actually underground and that little island that you can see on top yeah that's just the top of its head or back the reason you should never get onto one of the islands is because the creatures have a tendency to dive underwater if they feel weight on them and if they do that you could get sucked underneath the water and you'd be pretty helpless they're also pretty dangerous when they pop back up out of the water and because they cause huge waves to form not much else is known about these island creatures why they live here that kind of thing but the best advice I can give is to just avoid them. There are actually several outposts that are set up across the level. There's a Meg outpost, Hale Kapu, then there's Sandbar City, Captain's Craft, and Rose's Garden. Those are the documented ones so far. Most of the communities take place on like rafts and that kind of thing, and they kind of just cluster together and float, and they eat fish or whatever they can catch. But fish are pretty rare on this level. But to enter this level, you can swim into the ocean on level 48, and to exit, you can find a hole at Sandbar our city to be sent to level 628. But yeah, I thought this level was a nice and safe addition to the watery levels in the back rooms. There's not too many levels that are just water and islands and that kind of thing. But if you think about it, like level 7 is dangerous and it has some pretty hostile entities and effects on it and it's the first water level that you'll get to and then like level 7 11 which i just went over is also dangerous because its weather can turn bad in an instant then its water can swallow you to the ocean floor and then level 4000 or philosophobia is also dangerous because of its weather and anomalous effects and its entities that will try to lunge out of the water and grab you. So I think this level and level 100 maybe are really two of the only safe water levels that I've gone over. If I'm missing one, let me know. I don't think I am. You might be able to consider the pool rooms a water level, but I'm considering like outside water levels. But I'm considering ocean and outside water as the water levels. Anyways, yeah, I think it's a great addition to the lore. So Backrooms Level 931, or the Leafy Corridors, has a classification of Class 0. And it's safe and stable and devoid of entities, question mark. So it most likely is devoid of entities, but we don't really know. It's just up for debate. The beginning of the level shows itself as a long and winding concrete hallway that's huge and it has really tall ceilings and big glass windows on the left side. These windows are huge rectangles that look over this beautiful sky scene, and it's always this sunset time of day when you look outside. The ground of the hallway is made out of grass and flowers, and it gives off this eerie but relaxing feeling, almost like you've been there before. The sun that shines through the big windows gives this entire level a bright kind of glow that has a similar healing effect and calming effect that almond water does. So just by walking through the hallways, you'll 
you'll feel more alive and more comfortable and you'll start healing more and you'll just feel awesome i mean how can you not this entire level gives off a feeling of comfort and peacefulness a feeling of liminal heaven if you will it almost feels like an art piece in a way because it's so beautiful and eye-catching or maybe i'm just crazy and i'm looking into it too much i think it's beautiful the windows here actually don't have glass on them, so theoretically, you could just walk right out into the clouds to the side, but whatever you do, do not do that. You need to avoid the clouds at all costs, and I'll explain why later in the video. Just know that you gotta trust me. And I've never lied to you about anything backrooms related so far, so just trust me. So those grassy corridors that I just explained, that's the start of the level. It's kind of the zone where you'll spawn in and you'll be at for a while, but after you walk through it for a long time, you'll actually end up going to the second part of the level, which is just called part two. I know that's a crazy name, but you know. So part two of the level is a more enclosed space with less windows and less sunlight. This is the only part of the level that's considered really dangerous because it gives wanderers feelings of paranoia and uneasiness, and in some cases, dread. It's unknown exactly why it happens, but it's probably got something to do with there being no light and the hallways being claustrophobic and not open, and I don't know, maybe being stuck inside the back rooms forever. That might also cause you to have dread. Anyways, it doesn't matter what you're feeling in this portion of the level because the odds are you're still safe, which is nice. Around the floor on this section are random jagged rocks that are below the flowers, so don't step on those as well. But other than that, this part looks the same as the first part, minus the windows. Now, based on that paranoia and the dread feelings you might have that I just talked about, there's been multiple reports of people going insane while being stuck in this part two area for too long. Specifically, that it somehow depletes and lowers your sanity way faster than the other section. Because if you remember, the other section has that sunlight that gives you a healing property and kind of keeps you sane and calm. Well, this section doesn't. In order to counteract this effect, you just need to drink a bunch of almond water before you come here, and that should work, hopefully. But even if you drink almond water and aren't the type to go crazy, these darker areas will make you paranoid, and they probably will make you feel like something is right outside of the light and about to attack you. Who knows if there's something there? I hope there's not, but there might be. Now, after this first and then second part, there's a very rare and unexplored third part of the level that can also be dangerous if you don't explore it properly. The third part looks like the first part, with the big open windows and the grassy floors and the clouds outside, but this time, instead of it just being clouds in the sky, there's just ever so faintly a city inside the clouds. Just like a floating city, floating in the air, outside of the windows, on top of the clouds. Now at this point in the level is when your mind will try very hard to get you to jump out of the tunnel and into the clouds below. But you have to not do that if you want to survive, and the reason that the cloud area is so dangerous is because because it is a direct link to the void level. And if you don't know what the void is, it's pretty much just an infinite expanse of black nothingness that you're trapped into for all eternity, which is not very fun. And jumping onto these clouds seems to be, like I said, a direct link to the void. So just don't do that. No matter what your mind says, don't. The last part of the level is the fourth part, of course, and it's also where the exit is. Eventually, these grass halls will slowly start to transform into an area that's similar to an old abandoned mall. And when this happens, you'll know that you've successfully escaped and made it out to tell the tale. Now, this mall area isn't listed as an exit or a different level, so it's unknown if it's an actual level or if it's part of this level, level 931, but you can no clip through a wall to be sent out of this level to another one, so I guess it is an exit. But this mall area just looks like your typical abandoned mall that no one's been to for a while. It's very liminal, it's very cold and damp. You get the feeling. But besides a very small portion of this level, most of it is a beautiful, serene, safe, and just glorious looking level. And it's a real paradise if you're looking for a semi-infinite sunny hallway to lay down in the grass forever on. Now, if you're not looking for that, well, there's like a billion other backroom levels that you could choose from. But this one's definitely pretty cool. To enter it, you have to find a door 
on the hub level that's labeled level 931, or you can wander too far into level one that also seems to take people here. Now that could be very useful to speed run the back rooms because you could go from level one all the way to level 931, which is skipping 930 levels. So you might want to keep that in mind. To exit, you can walk far enough into that fourth part, which is the mall, and you can no clip out, or you can find a door on the right side of the hallway and go through it to be sent to level 184. If you remember, the windows are on the left side of the hallway, so the right side is where the concrete is, you can find a door there. Or you could just bring a huge store of almond water and stay here forever. It's pretty much up to you. So backrooms level 588 is, of course, classified as a class zero difficulty and is safe and secure with no entities. The level itself manifests as a massive pink sprawl of land and structures and light. The sky is always a pinkish violet color and the sun is always at a sunset positioning which kind of gives the entire level a relaxing kind of vibe. The land is flat and smooth and it seems to almost be digitally created because it's so perfect. Like there's no scratches or holes or anything on the walls or floors that seems to be damaged. It almost seems like it was just computer generated. And this kind of gives it an uncanny valley kind of feeling to wanderers who find themselves here. This level does actually have have some plants that grow on it. There's ankle length grass and some other kinds of tree plants that look like palm trees. And all of these things look slightly fake as well. They're also indestructible and can't be ripped up or torn out of the ground or anything like that, which is pretty strange if you think about it. All of the plants and structures here are violet and pink, just like the sky, and the entire level has that pinkish aura around it. The level is also kind of like an isolation chamber because you really can't encounter any other people or entities or anything else alive except you here. And on top of that, the entire place is extremely quiet, and the only sounds that happen are the sounds that you make. So like your footsteps and your breathing and whatever other things. Nothing else moves or makes noise except you. The buildings inside of this level are known as structs, which is short for structures, and there are several instances of these structs that you could run into while exploring around. Some of them look like houses, and others have no clear design and just seem to be random walls and roofs. They're made out of that same material that the ground is made out of too, and they all seem to have like these holes inside of them that look like windows, and sometimes they have porches and bedrooms and that sort of thing. Again, like the rest of the level, all of these structures seem computer generated or just fake in a way, and it feels weird that you can touch them. And even when you're inside of these houses, you can see that peaceful sunset lighting that's outside, but inside. There's also scattered furniture inside of the houses, like chairs and desks and that sort of thing, but it's not like regular stuff from real life because it all seems to have different density, meaning that there could be big pieces of furniture that you could pick up easily and they don't weigh anything, even though they're massive. But even though they're easy to pick up and they're light, they're all invincible and cannot be broken, just like the plants and everything else on the level. So there are structures that look similar to houses, and then there are also some that have pools in them, and there are also some that have curtains and other rooms inside of them as well. The pool ones have tiled walls and floors with water in it, and it kind of gives like a pool rooms vibe, except they're mainly outdoors, but they give you that same liminal feeling as the pool rooms. The water has no impurities at all, but it's not actually almond water. The temperature is perfect for the human body, so you could probably just take a swim around it and relax relax at any time, but it has been noted that drinking the water might make you feel lightheaded and weak and even give you feelings of loneliness, so you might not want to try that. There's been some other weird structures found too, like this huge pyramid with a bed on top of it, which like most of the level, makes absolutely no sense because why would someone put a bed at the top of the pyramid unless you want to just roll off the pyramid in your sleep or something. But this type of thing just adds to that uncanniness of the entire level. Speaking of beds, they're actually a pretty common anomaly on the level because you might just run into a random one on the shore or inside of the building or on top of a pyramid. They seem safe enough, but like I said, it's also random for them to be in the places they are. Who knows? So the main land of the level, which is the areas I just talked about, is actually surrounded by some sort of ocean or sea, and the further you go out 
into the sea, the darker everything gets, and the more glitchy and volatile and corrupt it becomes. So because of this, it is recommended to stay in the mainland part. Now, even though this level seems peaceful and relaxing, you do end up getting strong feelings of loneliness the longer you're here. And this is because you can't see any other wanderers or literally any other life at all, and it sort of becomes like this isolation chamber effect, which would be perfect for introverts, but for people who actually want to hang out and see other real things, it would be pretty scary to get stuck here. And because of all this isolation and lack of natural resources, there are no bases or outposts here, and you probably couldn't set one up. This level can be best described as a sort of dreamscape place where you're the only thing that can be existing here at this exact time. It seems like a paradise until you realize how isolating and lonely it becomes. Let me know in the comments if you could stay here forever or if you would get bored. To enter the level, you can be on a desert level like level 46 or 169 and find a mirror out in the middle of it, and the mirror will actually be pink because of the pink sunset on this one. No clip through that mirror and you'll be sent here. Or you might be able to be on a watery level and then swim towards a pink sunset to be sent here as well. To exit, you can noclip into a structure to be sent to level 48, or you can swim out into that ocean that surrounds the mainland for an unknown amount of time to be sent to an unknown level. I really like this level. I think it encapsulates what the backrooms is as a whole, because you're all alone here, and there's really nothing that can outright hurt you except yourself or your own mind, and that's because of how isolating it is. And I feel like most people would not want to stay here for long, even though it seems like paradise, the loneliness probably isn't worth it. Unless you just hate everyone, I guess. So Backrooms level Domus Aqua, or the House of the Water, is classified as a class zero difficulty, and it is safe and secure with absolutely no hazards at all unless you hate water or something like that. The level was discovered by a wanderer in the early 2000s, and there's only a handful of people that have even been here. The level itself takes the appearance of a single house that's partially submerged underwater and is surrounded by an ocean of shallow water. The boundaries of this entire level are not infinite because it seems after a mile or so, there's kind of like an invisible border or wall that stops you from walking further out, but it does look like water goes past that barrier so it could be infinite we don't know the house in the middle of the level is a two-story white house with windows on all sides the house itself seems very familiar but also very foreign to the people who have been here when you go through the door it's said that you get a sense of relaxation and calmness that rushes over you when you walk in this house as I said earlier, the entire house and the level is partially flooded, so you're going to have to walk through a couple of feet of water to explore any of it, and some of the rooms are deeper than the others. For example, the main floor and the basement are flooded more and have deeper water than the upstairs area. The actual water itself in this level is not almond water, which is weird because the pool room, which is the level before this one, has almond water as its main thing, but this just seems to be regular old water from real life. The water itself stays at a warm temperature throughout the entirety of the level, and it actually gets warmer the deeper you go. The upstairs of the level has less light that comes through because there's not as big of windows up there, and it is also flooded, just slightly less water. There are two bedrooms and a den area up in the upstairs, and these rooms, once again, feel very familiar. There's not really any furniture to speak of in the rooms, they're just rooms, and it's all flooded partially. The house also has a basement or downstairs floor, which can only be accessed through the pantry door in the kitchen of the main floor of the house. The main floor of the house itself just looks like a regular old house. There's a living room, a kitchen, a dining room, and a few closets. Once again, all of them are flooded. But once you open that pantry door to go downstairs, you'll see this long winding staircase that leads into a big body of water. This body of water looks like a giant pool. The water is the warmest on the entire level in this downstairs area, almost as warm as like a hot tub or something like that. The basement has this anomalous effect that makes it way bigger than it should physically be allowed 
out to be because the house looks normal sized on the outside but in this basement area it spans out for miles and you'll notice how big it is because just a few hundred yards from the staircase to go down you can see some exposed floor that eventually turns into this indoor downstairs play pool type area this area is very reminiscent of like an indoor water park type area from the early 2000s and it's the only part of the entire level that has floor that's not covered in water it's also the exit to the level, which I will talk about in a minute in the exit portion, but for now, I'll explain the entire downstairs. This play place area gives wanderers that same feeling of familiarity and loneliness and comfort that the upstairs does, but with more feelings of nostalgia and happiness. You just feel like you've been here before when you get here. The ambience is a calm sound of flowing and dripping water with a soft buzz of lights from the ceiling above and this feeling of nothing bad could possibly happen. As of right now, the outside, the main floor, the upstairs, and the basement are the only parts of the level that have been found, but there could be more hidden entrances under the water in other places. We don't know yet because not all the level has been explored. To enter this level, you have to be in the pool rooms somewhere, and then you randomly get sent here. It's not known how a person is chosen or why they're chosen to get sent here, but it's a very rare thing to happen. And if it happens to you, uh, consider yourself lucky, I guess. To exit the level, you have to go downstairs to this play place area, and you have to find this underground pool by the dry floor, jump into the pool, swim to the bottom, and then that'll send you back to the pool rooms where you came from, and no one that's been sent here has been able to find a way back. So you might want to take your time with exploring it. Also, there could be other exits to different sub-levels of this one. We just don't know yet because there's so little information on it. There are no entities, no outposts, and no dangers at all here. Just the calm, warm, relaxing world of water and nostalgia for you to explore. So level negative 33 has a classification of class zero and it's safe, secure, and just look how chill it is, dude. I mean, I would literally just bring me and my friends here to stay forever. The level is very unique because it's an extremely safe negative level and most negative levels are corrupted and dangerous because of how unstable or deep they are in the back rooms. But not this one, it's like an oasis. It's split up into four different parts and those parts are the pools, the darkness, the hallways, the outside, and then the ocean area. The entire level is infinite, but for ease of explaining, those are the four parts that I'm going to split it up into. The main part of the level is considered to be a massive hotel complex with a ton of hotel rooms inside. I mean, this thing is literally infinite. And there's multiple hotels too. The entire place has an eerie familiarness to it. Like you feel comfortable, but you've never been there. It's that type of thing. And these hotels have a slight chlorine smell to them and a sort of salty sea air scent too. And that's because scattered throughout the hotels and the rooms, there are large pools everywhere. These pools mostly have lights at the bottom of them that give a sort of liminal type of glow to them, and the light above the pools give off this really relaxing and secure feeling. Pretty much it's just a giant hotel with pools everywhere. The water inside of the actual pools is of course lukewarm, which is where the name of the level comes from. A lot of the pools themselves are inside of the bigger hotel rooms, but some can be in the hallways and on the roof and in small rooms, it just depends. And the pools can be as big as the room? or just a small corner of it. It just depends on where you go. The pools all have tiled surfaces, similar to the ones that you'd find in the pool rooms, except these tiles have some very different properties. They seem to absorb water very quickly, even if they get soaking wet. So if you're in a pool and you like splash water out of it onto the tiles outside, the tiles would literally just soak up the water and it would get completely dry which is pretty neat. Now, besides those pools inside of the rooms, there will also be beds and bookshelves and chairs and sofas and paintings and pretty much anything else that you'd find in like a resort hotel. These rooms have a very familiar and safe feeling to them, which adds to that liminal space and eerie vibe of the entire level. You feel comfortable here in a way. Some pools inside of the rooms or hallways don't have any lighting or much lighting at all, and these are the areas that are called the darkness. They give off feelings of uneasiness and paranoia, and you just feel wrong for standing in these dark areas. It's almost like something is right behind you about to grab you. 
kind of like that level in a pyrophobia. The water in these areas is calm, and you'll just hear dripping sounds and rippling sounds, but you still get that feeling of something just waiting in the darkness to try to eat you. You, you can't shake the feeling. The temperature of these dark areas is also colder than the rest of the level. The rest of the level is a lukewarm temperature, but here it gets really cold and the water can be frigid. In both the regular pools and the dark pools, the water also can be varying lengths and depths. It can go from really shallow to really deep, to just straight up infinite and the deeper the pools are the more unsafe that you'll typically feel getting into them since you can't see the bottom it would be terrifying like imagine getting into a pretty small pool lengthwise but then seeing that there's literally no bottom to it like it just goes down forever that would be terrifying the hallways are another big part of the level and they're endless in length just like the hotels. They're typically empty with really strange lighting and they feel very lonely and very liminal. Like you're not supposed to stay there for a long time. It's just a passing through area, but you feel like you're stuck there. They twist and they turn randomly too and they give off feelings of isolation and loneliness. It's also easy to get lost in the hallways because they turn so much, which that's no fun. They just look like big empty hotel hallways. Simple as that. In some rare areas of the halls, you might find a few sofas or vending machines or doors that lead to the next part of the level, which is called the outside. So the outside is just this unsettling looking empty outdoor pool area with very few street lights that give it this very eerie loneliness, just like the rest of the level. Now besides all these feelings of eeriness and loneliness, you're still safe, it just feels that way, it just feels dangerous, but it's not. There are bushes and trees here too that seem out of place, and there's paths that cut from the outdoor areas to other resorts and other buildings. The path area has the same curvy, windy feeling as the hallways do, and like I said, it can lead to other nearby pools and buildings and resorts as well. And the other buildings that are here, besides the main hotel, are other smaller resorts and other stores and other storage buildings and other pool areas. The stores themselves are small, but they look like typical supermarkets, except tiny. They all look very liminal, and they all have food on the shelves and water in the refrigerators. The other resorts are empty and have pools, just like the main resort you spawn in. And the storage places look like those self-storage ones from real life, with all the doors and stuff. All of this entire area is very lonely and comfort at the same time and it just feels like you're in this one massive liminal space it's so quiet and so empty and nothing's there except you and whoever else you bring now beyond the outside area and outside those paths and other buildings is the last area of the level which is the endless sea the endless sea is just an infinite expanse of lukewarm ocean water it has varying depths. There are some buildings that are on the edge of this ocean that overlook it, and there's also a beach area that goes along the coast. Just like the rest of the areas, this area is peaceful but lonely, and kind of creepy but also relaxing. And it also goes out in an infinite direction, just like the rest of the level. I know I've said that about a billion times. My bad. But it just feels like these beaches are a place to sit down and just think about everything. You know, think life's deepest thoughts. The water is lukewarm, and like I said, it has varying depths, and I mean, you can swim in it. There's been no animals found yet so it's just an empty ocean now back in those hotel areas and those resort areas there are places like these small liminal pools and these zones typically tend to make people have a complete sense of comfort and hominess and safety so they never leave plus being inside of the hotel building might make you feel more comfortable than being in the other places in the back rooms but most people that get sent here have traveled for years through all of the back rooms levels and when they get here they feel like they can finally rest and that's why this level's beautiful. In order to get to this heavenly backrooms level, you're gonna need to find a set of sliding glass doors on level negative 18, and to exit, you can noclip into a wall to be sent to the pool rooms level, but I think that I like this level better. Let me tell you why. I feel like you're trapped in the pool rooms. You know, I feel like you're kind of just in this one huge complex and it's beautiful and it's serene and it's comforting, but this area is just like a massive infinite row of resorts and stores that's completely empty to everybody except you. Everything's full of pools and liminal spaces and everything is so empty and relaxing. I just feel like it's more open and expansive than the pool rooms. But that's just my opinion. Let me know what you think in the comments. So level a ship to nowhere is classified as a class variable difficulty because it is kind of unstable and it also has a diverse entity count. 
The level itself, or what I'll call the St. Mary from now on, takes place on an anomalous cruise ship that can be seen traveling across different levels in the back rooms. The actual ship itself is thought to be its own entity or level because it seems alive in a way. It's unknown if the ship travels interdimensionally through these backrooms levels on its own or if the backrooms controls where it goes. Let me know in the comments what you think. The actual vessel itself is a Voyager class cruise ship that looks to be an old and weathered ship most of the time. You can even see holes and big gashes in the side of it if you look closely. None of that matters though, because this ship can repair itself automatically. Of course, it does this in an unknown way, but hey, that's the backrooms for you. Nothing has to make sense. On board of the ship, she has a crew that seems to be made up of faceling entities, very similar to the entities that run the apartment complex on level 13. The facelings really don't do anything because the ship drives and navigates itself, but they think that they take care of the ship and serve it, kind of like it's their master. So, like I said earlier, the ship can travel through different backrooms levels seemingly with ease. Like normally, a person would have to find an exit or no clip out of that level to get to the next one, but the St. Mary can just dissolve into different levels with no problems. We have absolutely zero idea how this happens or why it happens, but it does. And you actually might be able to use it to your advantage. You can do that by staying on it until it docks to a level you want to go to, but more on that later. On its own, the ship just floats around through a foggy ocean in the back rooms. It can wander in this foggy, stormy ocean for days or months, and people who have been on the ship say that they're kind of trapped inside of it when it goes on these adventures between levels because you can't really no-clip away, it doesn't work. You have to wait until the ship stops moving and then get off on whatever dock you're at. And when the St. Mary is docked, anyone can get off, but there is no time or schedule when she leaves port. It just happens randomly with no reason. I'm sure you're asking, what's actually on the ship? Well, for the people who are willingly staying on it, they'll see cabins and rooms and casinos and theaters and spas and even swimming pools on deck, as well as things like kitchens and dining rooms and bars and lounges and everything you'd find on like an old fancy hotel ship. Inside of the bars and kitchens, the facelings serve a wide variety of foods and drinks if you ask for them, which theoretically means you could stay on this level for as long as you'd like and kind of go on a vacation through all the backrooms levels if you want to. Now, the St. Mary does have some interesting characteristics to say the least, and they kind of make her a little strange, specifically when she's docking and when she's on the open waters. So when she's in port, the ship is kind of in this dormant healing state where most of the power is cut and it doesn't move for days and it kind of just sits there and floats. She's even been seen docking inside of a large pool rooms room before, which would be really weird just walking through the pool rooms and seeing a freaking boat right there. But that does show you that it doesn't matter how big the level is, if there's water, this boat could be there. But when she's out on the open water, she's at her full strength and is pretty much sentient and decides wherever she's going and whatever she wants to do. And these open water type areas are located between the levels she travels to, kind of like how the blue channel channel is between other backrooms levels, this ocean type area is between it for the St. Mary. So yeah, the entire level takes place on the ship and the ship itself is considered the level two. And on top of that, the area that immediately surrounds the ship is also considered to be part of the level. For example, when the St. Mary is docked in a place like the pool rooms, uh, the room itself is seen growing huge and huge to expand to make itself fit the St. Mary inside of it. It also has this effect on the water underneath it because the pool room's water by itself wouldn't be deep enough to have a ship, so it makes the water go down to an infinite level below it. And as I just said, when the ship isn't in a known backrooms level and is just out on the open ocean, it always looks like this endless foggy expanse of water. And it's thought to be this transitional space between levels, just like the blue channel is between other levels. This area has its own environment and everything, and it even has its own day and night cycle that seems pretty normal. There's also a huge amount of water creatures and entities that live around and below the ship, and I'll get into those right now.
The first ones are these large neon jellyfish things that light up the waters around the boat. They seem to be aggressive, so it's probably not smart to jump overboard or anything. Then there's this starfish-like creature that sort of acts like a parasite in a way because they attach onto the ship and onto other entities and absorb energy from whatever they're attached to. Also, apparently, they're harvested and served as food on the ship. So if you want some fancy starfish, come to the St. Mary and eat it. Next are these carpet stingray type things, which are just huge, massive stingrays that blend into the environment very well, kind of like a gecko. They kind of just change their skin color based on the weather. They're literally so big that they kind of look like islands off in the distance, but they seem docile and nice enough. But of course, the ocean isn't fully safe, because why would it be? The next two entities are scary and thalassophobia inducing. So watch out. The colossal leviathans and the seafarer are the two entities I'm talking about, and the leviathans are just just like their name implies. They're hundreds of meters in size, and they look like a giant worm whale hybrid thing. Sometimes one can even be seen following near the St. Mary itself, and it just gives off this really creepy thalassophobia, like stalking vibe. We have no idea why it's stalking the St. Mary, but we I just assume it wants to attack it. Next is the Seafarer, which is a large shark type entity that kind of looks like an underwater dragon. This entity also seems to travel close to the St. Mary when it's in this transitional space, and it almost guides the St. Mary and protects it from other entities that would attack it, like the Leviathan. Of course, we have no idea why it saves the St. Mary or why it protects it, but I'm glad it does, because I don't want to be eaten by a giant water worm. As far as colonies and outposts go, uh, the St. Marys can hold around 4,000 people, and some of them live permanently on board, so you could call that a community, but there's also other groups that are stranger, like the Children of the Sea, who live on the boat, and they worship the sea creatures as like gods and deities, which is weird. If you want to know all about them, check the full article below. It's pretty interesting. To enter the level, you have a chance to get sent to the ship on any water-based level you go to, but be warned that when you get on it, there is no getting off until you get to the next port. So, to exit, you have to do what I just said and wait till the ship docks somewhere, and when it fully stops, you can get off. So far, it's been seen on level 7, 37, 300, 100, 30, and 155, as well as several others. But also, there's no exact schedule for her travels. She's just always going wherever she wants. 